in the seventh year after the Hijrah, the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alayhi Wa Ala Alihi Wasallam sent Al Harith ibn Umair Al Azdi with a letter to Asham to the Roman ruler of Busra, which they call Basra. And this companion, he was intercepted and tied up and beheaded. It was said that this is the only messenger of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was killed during his mission. Even amongst the kuffar, there was a rule, which is that you do not kill the messenger. That's how they used to send messengers while they were at war back and forth between each other. So that's a war crime. So when the news of this incident reached the Prophet ﷺ, he was very disturbed by it. And he prepared an army to be sent to a town called, or an area called Mu'ta. That's in modern day Jordan. He put in charge of this army Zayd ibn Haritha and second in command was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and third in command was Abdullah ibn Rawaha. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam he said that if Zayd were killed then Ja'far should be in charge. And if Ja'far were killed, then Abdullah ibn Rawaha should be in charge. So the Muslims, they prepared themselves for battle. They had a large army of 3,000. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he sent them there. And he commanded them to call those people to Islam. And that if they embrace Islam, that there is to be no fighting. And... When they reached the area, the uh, vicinity there, the Romans got word of the Muslim army. And so Heraclius, that same one who was ready to embrace Islam before, when he got the prophet's message, and he had a meeting with Abu Sufyan, if you remember the story, he prepared a massive army to meet those Muslims. He had noticed that the Muslim army would be a relatively small army. Yani, when you're dealing with a super, what's called a superpower like the Romans or the Persians, but they always won. So he said, I'm going to wipe them out with a massive, massive army. And he prepared an army of tens of thousands of Roman soldiers and also allies, Arab allies, to fight the Muslims. So when the Muslims knew about the massive army that had mobilized to deal with them, then they had to plan what to do. Some of them said, Let's send a message back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and tell him about the news of the enemy. And then perhaps he will send us reinforcements or he will tell us to do whatever he tells us to do and then we'll do it. But Abdullah ibn Rawaha, he was the third in charge. He stood up and he delivered a speech to the Muslims. He said, when we fight, we do not count on our numbers. And we do not count on our equipment. Rather, we fight with this religion. Yani, we fight with this religion that Allah has endowed us with. He said to them, so rush, go. To win one of the two good things, victory or martyrdom. And so the Muslims, they said, Wallahi, he's right. So the Muslims, 3,000 Muslims, decided to stand up against 
tens of thousands of well-equipped, well-trained Roman professional soldiers, a professional army. So it was at the town of Mu'tah that the fighting broke out. So Zayd ibn Haritha, who was in charge, he fought valiantly holding the banner of the Prophet والسلام, like a flag of the Muslims until he was killed. Then Jafar, the son of Abu Talib, he took the banner and he also fought valiantly. He held the banner in his right hand until his hand was severed. So he took it with his left hand and then that hand was severed. So then he took up that banner and he held it to his chest. He, what's the word? He nestled it to his chest. And then they killed him. May Allah have mercy upon him. The Prophet wasallam said that in paradise, Allah will give him wings for the hands that he lost. And in paradise, he will be able to fly wherever he wants. It was reported that there were 90 stabs and cuts on Ja'far just between his chest and his shoulder blades. So after Ja'far was killed, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, he took the banner. And he fought until he was killed. Then a Muslim named Thabit, Thabit ibn Akram, he took the banner and he said, Oh Muslims, decide on a man among you. They said, You. He said, I'm not the one. So they said, Khalid ibn al Walid. And so Khalid ibn al Walid, he took charge. And if you remember, in the Battle of Uhud, he was the one who noticed that the archers left their positions in the Battle of Uhud. And then he brought his soldiers around and they surprised the rest of the archers, killed them, and then they came onto the Muslims. They surprised the Muslims in the Battle of Uhud and what happened, happened. He was the same one, he had embraced Islam. He had already embraced Islam and we talked about that. So he took charge of the army and Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala inspired him with a great war strategy. So he made the Muslims on the right side, he made the right flank move to the left side. And he made the left flank move to the right side. And so the Romans thought that the Muslims that they were fighting, whether they were on the right side or the left side, they thought that the Muslims that they were fighting were getting reinforcements. Because they saw new Muslims coming in from between those whom they were fighting. And so this helped the Muslims. And the Muslims were able to back out of that very fierce, very dangerous situation. The whole army, they were able to back out of there. And Allah Ta'ala protected the Muslim army by Khalid ibn al-Walid, rahimahullah tabaraka wa ta'ala. And Allah Ta'ala made the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam see the condition of the army. And he went up on the member, on the pulpit, and he called the people. And he said to the people, I will inform you of your fighting army. They met the enemy and Zayd was killed as a martyr. And then the Prophet made dua for him. And he said, and then Jafar, he took up the banner and he charged the enemy until he was killed as a martyr. And then the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, made dua for him. And he said, and then Abdullah ibn Rawaha, he took up the banner and he stood fast until he was killed. And then Khalid ibn al-Walid, he took the banner. Oh Allah! Indeed, he is a sword among your swords. So make him victorious. And ever since then, Khalid ibn al-Walid, he was called Saifullah, the sword of God, the sword of Allah. And the Muslim army, they returned 
they came back. When they got close to Medina, the Muslims went out to meet their army. And the Muslims who were martyred, there were 12 of them out of that army of 3,000, 12 of them were killed. And as for the Romans, a big number of them were killed. And there doesn't, I didn't find that the Muslims recorded the number of Romans who were killed. And nor did I find that the Kufar recorded the number of Romans who were killed. That the Romans recorded that also. So, there were 12 Muslims who were killed in that whole army. And as for the Romans, they lost a big number. Now, who won this battle? Some say that the Muslims won this battle. Some say that the Muslims lost this battle. And some say that this battle was a draw. But depending on how you look at it, it was certainly a victory for the Muslims who stood their own against a massive, professional, feared army, the army of the Romans. And that's after they took Khaybar, if you remember. And also, the other battles that the Muslims had fought very successfully and so the Muslims gained a great military reputation because of this. At some point, the tribe of Quraysh broke the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. That's because in Arabia at that time, there were now two major powers. The Muslims and the people of the Haram, Quraysh. And all the tribes were either on the Muslim side or Quraysh's side. And one of the terms of the treaty was that Quraysh could not assist anyone in fighting an ally of the Muslims. And they did just that. So one of the allies of Quraysh, Banu Bakr, or the tribe of Bakr, they attacked the tribe of Khuza'ah. And Quraysh helped them secretly. And they killed men from Khuza'ah. And Khuza'ah, they were allies of the Muslims. So Khuza'ah, they sent... As reported, two men came to the Prophet ﷺ. I don't know if they had other men with them. So a delegation came to the Prophet ﷺ seeking his assistance. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he promised to support them. And when the Kuffar in Mecca realized that they breached the treaty, and that this was a very serious matter because now the Muslims were no longer the weaklings they were when they were in Mecca. So they sent Abu Sufyan to speak with the Prophet والسلام, and to reaffirm the treaty and to even extend it. Abu Sufyan, he came to Medina and he went to visit his daughter who was the wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, Um Habiba. Her name is Ramla. So when Abu Sufyan came, he wanted to sit down on the mattress. She folded the mattress so that he couldn't sit on it. And he told her, you like this mattress more than me? I'm your father. She said, this is the mattress of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And you are Mushrik Najis man. He said to her, something bad happened to you after me. Like he disapproves of the manners of his daughter dealing with her father. So Abu Sufyan, he went to talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet did not say anything. So Abu Sufyan, he knew he was in trouble. So he went to Abu Bakr, he talked to Abu Bakr to talk, he asked him to talk to the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam, he refused. And he went to Omar and he refused. 
Then he went to Fatima and Ali, and they refused. It was even reported that he told Fatima, send your little son Hassan. She refused. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he ordered the Muslims to mobilize. And Abu Sufyan, he went back empty-handed. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he made dua, and he asked Allah to keep his plans to invade Mecca hidden from the people of Quraysh. But among the Muslims was a man named Hatib. And this man, this man Hatib, he was from the people of Badr, who fought in the battle of Badr. So Badr was the first one, and Uhud was after Badr. The way I remembered them is that Badr starts with Ba, and Uhud starts with Alif, and the Ba came before the Alif in this case, Badr, Uhud. So that's how I remembered that Badr is before Uhud. And the Muslims of Badr, they have a very high status, very special status. What did Haltib do? He wrote a message warning the people of Quraysh from the Prophet's invasion. And he gave it to a woman, and he gave her some money, and she took the message. But Allah wa ta'ala gave the Prophet والسلام, revelation about this woman. So he sent Ali and Zubair to go intercept her. So they caught her, and they made her get down off of her ride. And they checked her luggage, and they didn't find the message they said, Wallahi, the messenger of Allah did not lie. So they threatened to kill her. She said, you're not going to kill me. So then they threatened to strip her. She said, you wouldn't. And then when she saw that they were dead serious, she said, turn away. So they turned away and she uncovered herself. I don't know what. And then she pulled out the letter and she gave it to them. And the Prophet والسلام, he called for Hatib and he asked him, why did you do that? And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he said, O Messenger of Allah, let me cut his head off. He is a hypocrite. So Hatib said, Wallahi, I am not a hypocrite and I didn't do it because I changed my religion. He said, but I'm not a Qurashi, and my family is there. So I wanted to give them something by which they would have mercy on my family. And the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did not let Umar cut that man's head off. And he verified that man's excuse. And the Prophet والسلام, he managed to make sure that the people of Mecca did not know about his plans to march on them. And when he went out of Medina with his army, no one stayed behind. And he left in Ramadan in the eighth year of the Hijrah with about 10,000 soldiers. And they were fasting. When the army reached the area called Al-Kadid, Al-Kadid, the Prophet wasallam he broke his fast, and the Muslims also broke their fast. And the Prophet wasallam he marched until he reached a place called Marru Zahran. In the meantime, Abu Sufyan and another man, they left Mecca as scouts. And then he got captured. He was brought to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and the Prophet talked to him and he embraced Islam. Although he didn't embrace Islam easily, immediately, and the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, was stern with him. Abu Sufyan said to him, Fi nafsi minha shay, hatta al-an. It means, he's saying, uh, I have something in myself against this. I'm, until now, I'm not comfortable with this. So it was reported that it was said to him, embrace Islam before you get your head cut off. So he embraced Islam. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he ordered Al-Abbas to take Abu Sufyan 
to the tight spot of the valley so that he could see all of the army pass by. And he saw the tribes passing by, tribe after tribe, each one equipped for war until, and he was impressed with all of them until the last troop came past and he saw men who were in their armor and all he could see was their eyes. He said, who are those? So he was told, that's the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his army of immigrants and ansar. And then it was said to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, Abu Sufyan, he likes to be respected. So do something for him. Give him something. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, he commanded that it would be shouted out, whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. Whoever goes to Al-Masjid Al-Haram is safe. And whoever goes into his house and locks the door is safe. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he sent a Zubair with a part of the army to enter Mecca from the north. And to plunge the banner into the ground. And to stay there until the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, came. And he commanded Khalid ibn al-Walid to enter Mecca from the south and to plunge his banner in an area very close to the homes of Mecca. And some tribes went with him. And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, who was the leader of the Ansar, he was commanded to enter from the northeast. He came in from the east, but to the north. And the Prophet والسلام, he commanded all of them not to start fighting unless it was in self-defense. And it happened that when Khalid ibn al-Walid came in from the south, some of the kuffar attacked him. So he fought them back and he defeated them and he managed to kill about 24 of them. They ran away, some of them went into the mountains. And when the Prophet والسلام, noticed that there was some fighting he said, didn't I command for no fighting? They said, Khalid must have been attacked. And then they found that that's what happened. The Prophet والسلام, he entered Mecca with a black turban and with his head down. Why was his head down? Out of humility for what Allah gave him. And subhanAllah... These battles of the Prophet wasallam should be an indication for a smart person that Muhammad wasallam was indeed a prophet. Because if we look at his history, he wasn't even a soldier originally, let alone a general. The Prophet wasallam he found that the mushriks had 360 idols all around the Kaaba. So he started poking those idols with a branch or a rod that he had. And anytime the Prophet ﷺ would poke one of those idols or even point at one, it would fall over. Despite that, Iblis made sure that those idols were weighed down with lead so that they wouldn't tip. So the Prophet والسلام, he wanted to degrade those idols and humiliate their worshippers. And inside the Kaaba, the Prophet والسلام, he found pictures that the Kuffar had put there, pictures of the angels as women, and pictures of Ibrahim and Ismail using the uh, arrows of luck or arrows of fortune that the Islam that the Arabs used to use in their superstitious practices, which is that they would have three arrows if they wanted to do something, just the shaft, the shaft of the arrow. And written on one shaft would be, Amarani Rabbi, my Lord commands me. And written on another shaft would be, Nahani Rabbi, my Lord forbids me. And on the third arrow, nothing would be written, or it might be written, la wa la, not this and not that. So if he pulls out the one that says, my Lord commands me, he would say, this will 
be successful, and then he will do what he wants to do. If he pulls out the one that says, my Lord forbids me, he would say, this will not be successful, and he abandons it. And if he pulls out the blank one, he would draw again until he gets one of the other two. So the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he commanded for that to be removed. And he said, Wallahi, those disbelievers know that Ibrahim and Ismail did not practice that. And then the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he addressed the people of Quraysh. And he said to Quraysh, مَا تَرَوْنَ أَنِّي فَاعِلٌ فِيكُمْ What do you think I will do to you? They said, you will treat us well. They knew that. And the Prophet والسلام, he didn't massacre them. He didn't enslave them and take all their money. He let them go. After they harassed him and assaulted him and his followers and killed them also, he let them go. And the Prophet والسلام, on that day he said, there is no hijrah after the opening of Mecca. Ya'ani, it is no longer obligatory on the Muslims to leave Mecca to come to al Madina. Now that Mecca has been conquered, the hijrah is no longer obligatory. As you know, it was a personal obligation on whoever was able to make the hijrah to do so. And some scholars concluded from this that it is no longer obligatory to make hijrah they concluded from this that mecca will be a muslim town until the end of the world once that happened once the muslims took mecca then people just started coming to the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam embracing islam in batches in big numbers and during this event abu bakr brought his father, who had not yet embraced Islam, Abu Quhafa. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Why didn't you leave the Shaykh and let me come to him? And Abu Bakr said, He should come to you, O Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he passed his hand over Abu Quhafa's chest, and told him, Aslim, embrace Islam. And then he embraced Islam. And then the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, commanded to have him cleaned up and have his hair combed. And Allah, tabaraka wa ta'ala, revealed to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا It means, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When there comes the support of Allah and the conquering of Mecca, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا And when you see, O Muhammad, the people entering into the religion of Allah in batches or in groups, whole tribes were embracing Islam. Yani, there's something implied here. It means what's implied is not stated in the ayah. Then soon is your time of death, O Muhammad. When the support of Allah comes and Mecca is conquered and you see the people embracing Islam in batches, then what? Then soon you will die after that, Muhammad. The Prophet ﷺ, he would be shaking men's hands, people's hands. All the people are embracing Islam. He was going and shaking people's hands as they were embracing Islam, but not the women. He didn't shake the hands of the women, but they were embracing Islam too. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam.